it's uh, the Ice Age is a strange phenomenon. You know, it wasn't in a sense, it wasn't that long ago, really. Um, but uh, of course, it's outside of human memory. And uh, there were humans around during the end of it. Uh, and it's very, it's really important to us. And I, I should say right at the outset, uh, I'm not a physical scientist anymore. I used to be, but I'm a sociologist and, and my interest in it is really sociological. And uh, in this book that just came out a couple of weeks ago, it's called Ice Ages. This isn't really the cover. Um, I try to tell two stories and they're really sociological stories. And that is, uh, the first one is just how did we come aware of this ice age? And in fact, how did we come aware of the long history of the earth, which is fairly recently, you know, until about, uh, well, let's say the time of the revolution, you know, 1789, the French Revolution, 1789, people really had little notion of what the, if there was a history of the earth, they either, they either assumed it was fairly uh, new, if you followed anything like the biblical version of it, and that there had been humans around virtually the whole time. Or on the other hand, they really didn't think it had a history because it had no beginning and no end. It just kind of continued on. And similarly, there were always people around. And of course, the view that we have since developed and it really developed in about 50 years after the French Revolution, was that uh, it was, the Earth history is, is a real thing. It's very long, it's very old. We don't know how old it was at that time, but it was very long, much more than, than uh, 6,000 years of the Bible. And uh, for, furthermore, humans weren't around until the very end. It mostly was a non-human existence in the earth and and working out that history has been a, a an agenda item for subsequent time and something here is ringing i think it's probably a robocall uh forgive me if those interruptions occur you get too many of them so so that's the first thing there are a number of ice ages when we think of the ice age we usually think of the last ice age which is called the Pleistocene Ice Age. And it has dates that are given by convention. There's an international geological convention. And those dates tend to vary from year to year, depending on what discoveries have been made. But the currently, the, the Pleistocene Ice Age is dated from 2.6 million years ago until about 12,000 years ago. So roughly two and a half million years ago. And furthermore, it, it wasn't a single ice age. It wasn't that we got ice and it stayed that way until it melted. It was a coming and going of ice. There were repeated advances and retreats, uh, cold and warm periods of earth. And we're now in a, a moderate period, quite a warming period since about 12, 13,000 years ago. And that's been very important for humans, of course. So that's the first notion. The Pleistocene Ice Age came and went several times. It is thought on poorer evidence that there were many prior ice ages, uh, perhaps as many as five ice ages, most of them predating human or even life on Earth. And at one point it is thought the whole earth froze over. It was sometimes called a snowball earth. Uh, this is not uh, fully confirmed. One doesn't know for sure. And if that indeed happened, it's very difficult to think, well, how did it melt if there was never any place where uh, it wasn't ice? And the best answer anybody could give is, uh, well, if that happened, it was volcanism. Volcanoes came and spewed carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and that produced a warming effect. So this gets very conjectural, but the Pleistocene Ice Age in the last two and a half million years is really quite well established. There's no, there's no doubt of it. But as a sociologist, really what interests me about it is two social stories. One of them is a sociology of science, and that is how did we come to recognize that there was indeed 
this fairly recent ice age within human experience, number one. And the second story is what effect did the ice age and its ending have on human society? And it turns out it had really quite a profound effect on human society. So that's where I'm, that's where I'm going. And I do wanna invite you to interrupt at any time asking questions or making points. And I just read the book myself a couple of weeks ago because it just came out. So I put together these notes and I've never given this talk before and there's no need to go to the end of it, whatever I've set up. So we could just chat for an hour. Well, here's the title of the book. I like the title, I can't take responsibility for it. But uh, it emphasizes that there were multiple ice ages, and it shows the presence of ice and of animals that aren't quite like we know today. These are this is a woolly mammoth, and of humans hunting it, and that's all true, or at least part of it. And an interesting feature of the ice age, at least the Pleistocene ice age, is it pretty much coincides with the existence of the genus Homo on Earth. There were earlier kinds of humanids, hominids, but they weren't called humans. They weren't called Homo by anthropologists. There were earlier types. So, so it's interesting, it's really pointed out, but it's really pretty much synchronous, the occurrence of the Pleistocene Ice Age and the development of Homo into us, into Homo sapiens, our particular species. So back around the time of the French Revolution, as I said very briefly, there really wasn't a notion that Earth had a history, except maybe as recounted in the Bible, if you, if you took that literally. Um, but other things were going on at the time, intellectual things were going on at the time. For one thing, it was the period of the Enlightenment. It kind of starts with Isaac Newton developing his remarkable theories of gravitation and showing with logical deduction, you can learn things about the natural world and that they should be tested with evidence. They shouldn't just be taken on authority. And people started applying that in a wide ranging way to all sorts of things, natural sciences, history, human affairs, and in, Indeed, it's well known that our founding fathers in this country were, um, were deists. Uh, one thinks immediately of Thomas Jefferson or Benjamin Franklin. They were very rationalist kinds of guys. They were very interested in science and technology and, and in fact, in engineering and in digging up things. They became interested in fossils, partly because they were looking for coal and they were looking for other ores in the earth. And in doing that, they became aware of what did people noted casually before the stratification of the piles, but they noticed, paid more attention to the fossils you'd find in them. And it took them a while to realize that fossils were actually remnants of living things, because you know, after all, they're rocky things. But they realized by this time that they had been living things. And they realized that some of those living things were uh, strangely different than anything we know today. Now, these are, does anybody know what these creatures are? These are called trilobites. And uh, I found these uh, along with one of my sons-in-law in the Finger Lakes of our area, just an hour's drive from here. And uh, you don't, they don't exist anymore. Trilobites are a part of the ancient life that was here a long, long time ago for a very long period of time. Different kinds of trilobites. There were like beetles kind of, there were all kinds of them. They were all over the place, but you didn't know for sure whether they existed elsewhere or not. Here's another one that you can find in this area if you're very lucky. This looks like a flower, but it's actually an animal. It's called a crinoid. And what's very, very common if you dig around the Finger Lakes is you find little pieces of this. So for example, you find uh, little pieces of the skeleton of this thing. They look like coins. You really find a beautifully articulated one like this, but it turns out actually these aren't totally gone because uh, in, in the Caribbean, there are occasional uh, examples of living crinoids. So you know, to say they're an extinct form isn't quite right. Um, but then there are some 
forms, this is a, an early dinosaur remain reconstruction for the Crystal Palace exhibit in London in uh, mid 19th century uh, by Richard Owen and something like this, which is very, very big. You can't really tell from this, this uh, picture. Uh, and by the way, its current reconstruction looks considerably different. It looks like this. But if this were still around, you really couldn't miss it very well. So it's pretty clear that these things are gone. And then there are even some mammalian forms like this. This is a sloth. And if any of you have traveled to Central America or South America, you know sloths are still around. But they're little things. You know, they're about the size of a dog or a monkey. So this is a huge huge sloth and it's put on display. You can see a Victorian gentleman there looking at the display. So it became pretty clear by the 19th century that there were a lot of animals that were gone. And in fact, this is a reconstruction of a diagram of life by a guy named John Phillips from 1860. And he recognized, and forgive me if you can't see the whole slide here, but he recognized that there was a period that he called Paleozoic, or very old life, that had things like trilobites in it. And then there was a period later on, he didn't know how much later, but later on that had things like dinosaurs in it. And then there was a period later on, which he called Cenozoic, which had things which either we see today or are reminiscent of things we see today, like mammoths or saber-toothed cats, like you see in the, um, in the movies of Ice Age. So it was clear that there was a history. They didn't know how to date it, but they could tell it must have been very, very long ago, certainly longer than 6,000 years ago, discussed in the Bible. And from these fossils, it became lots of interesting inferences could be made. For example, you all know today that the continents didn't always occupy their present places. Well, one of the most important evidences that they had once been stuck together is that if you look at certain types of fossils, you find them in different continents today. And if you Imagine the continents stuck together. These form contiguous areas. So these are all the same fossils spread along the continents from the days when the continents were still Pangaea or Gwandalan. And the uh, continents of Europe and North America used to be stuck together. There wasn't an Atlantic Ocean between them. And you can trace that by the same kinds of trilobite fossils that span the two areas that would be contiguous if you, if you stuck them together. So, so this view of the world becomes quite developed, quite differently developed. Now, there were other things going on at the same time. One of them was the industrial revolution, the industrial transformation. And of course, there was great desire for coal and other ores, which was one of the motives for digging into the earth and trying to understand the structure of the earth. But another movement of the time was called the Romantic Era. And that was really the movement that was disgusted with all of the rationalism, rationalism of science and scientism and industrialization and envisioned an emphasis on emotions and romance and olden days and nature and forests and woods that used to be feared places became romantic places, and you would go walking in them. And, and uh, someone like uh, James Fenimore Cooper would romanticize them and their inhabitants, the noble savages in our, in our area. Uh, and this would be a, a, an elevated form of nature and of humanity, not degraded by the industrial condition. And there was an interesting scientific aspect to this um, uh, romantic period because it brought people, particularly geologists and naturalists, out into nature and hiking around rather like this fellow in this painting by uh, Casper uh, David Friedrichs. He's quite a, a famous painter of, of um, romantic images. 
And this guy, can you see him on your screen? Because on my screen, it kind of interferes. Not well, it's articulated. Wait a minute. It's kind of interfering with the uh, headlines of the screen. But this is a guy named Louis Agassiz. And he is the person who is usually considered the discoverer of the ice ages. And he was a Swiss. And in some ways, he was a very admirable guy. He was a brilliant lecturer. He was charming. He was very bright. He was very productive. In other ways, he was not so nice. He was a racist. He taught that Negroes were an inferior population. He never accepted Darwin. Uh, he left his first wife in Switzerland to become a Harvard professor and, uh, and marry another wife in America. Um, interestingly, one of his sons became also a Harvard professor who did believe in evolution. But he was the guy who used to just like the wanderer go trekking in the Alps and look at the glaciers. And in talking to uh, people of the time, woodchoppers, uh, tradesmen of the time, he learned some interesting things that would pertain to a puzzle for geology of the time. And the puzzle that people were addressing in a lot of geological circles was uh, the, these large boulders that didn't belong where they were. They were called erratics. And there were a number of them strewn across Europe and actually across America too. This particular one is, is called Dome's Rock. It's famous erratic, it's on Cape Cod. And the basic idea of this thing is here is this huge boulder and it doesn't belong there. It's identifiably a kind of rock that doesn't come from any place nearby. And furthermore, there's no nearby mountain for it to roll down from, and there's no obvious way that it could have gotten there. But you can find similar rocks some distance away. So the question is, how did these erratics get from the place where they presumably originated to the place where they were found? And uh, that was very puzzling, and nobody really had a good answer for that. And a lot of the people who, whom uh, um, Agassiz and his friends trekking the Alps came across said, well, you know, it's very simple. These were carried here by glaciers. They get embedded in glaciers. And when Agassiz came uh, around to publishing his book, his first book on glaciers, he had some wonderful woodcuts in there. And this is one that shows one of the Alpine glaciers. And you can see it, it looks like it's a flowing river. And indeed, glaciers do flow very slowly downhill. And in this one, there is a, a boulder embedded. And the, the answer that he gave, and that many people, low tradespeople in the area gave to him, was that these glaciers had once been much greater in extent and they carried the, glacier, the boulders down. That's how the erratics move. And in fact, he started finding as they recognized or pointed out to him that there were certain telltale signs in the landscape that boulders and glaciers had moved across the area. And one of them is striations in the rock. You can see these indentations here. And the idea is the moving ice with its embedded stones and pebbles scoured the ice and made these grooves. And in other places, they scoured it so that it became shiny. This is called glacial polish. And you'd come across these things if you were just trekking out and you'd think, wow, that's interesting. Where did that come from? Without really knowing. And it turns out they're abundant in the Alps and in Northern Europe, and indeed in North America. And another sign of glaciers that we know well here are called drumlins, that, that is these peculiar hills. In fact, this is the view out my study window that when I look over my computer screen, I see right now as I'm talking to you, these are our glacial deposited hills. And they have very peculiar shapes. They're teardrop shapes. 
And if you went inside these hills, they'd be conglomerates of all kinds of stones, sometimes fossils, that would have been carried along by the glaciers and, and left there. So in a way, these things are very, very obvious if you know what to look for. But when Argazis presented this at his first scientific congress, he was vehemently uh, shouted down. Um, and this, despite the fact that he, although he was a young guy, he was an ex respected member of the community. He was respected because of his work on fossil fish. He was known as an ichthyologist and people had come expecting that. And when he started talking about glaciers and a former ice age where they'd been much larger in extent, uh, people thought that was not only strange, but weird and actually uh, intellectually abusive. And uh, one of the big problems was how did you get ice ages if it was, how could it have been cold? Because from what we know of the fossil remains and especially of the, of the vegetation remains and cold deposits, they were tropical plants. Former climates must have been warm and you're saying they were cold. And how in the world can you account for that? And he had it. He presented this theory. See what you think of this. He, he drew a, uh, a, a parallel between suites of animals that had existed in former times and a living human organism or, or any animal organism. He said, when the orbit, before the organism begins, there's no heat there. And when the organism is living, it generates heat. And when the organism dies, the heat goes, it becomes cold. And he draw the analogy with a suite of animals that existed in any period of time. And he said, as, as the suite of animals comes into existence, it generates heat. And when that suite of animals goes extinct, then it becomes cold. And that's how you get cold climates. Well, of course, there wasn't a shred of evidence for that. And it seemed if it seems today like that's such a cockamamie theory, it seemed to his contemporaries that was a cockamamie theory too, and it was totally rejected. Of course, the fact that he turned out to be right was, was another issue. So an interesting question is what finally turned people in his, in his uh, direction? And that was, I think, primarily the, the voyages of exploration that were going on up the coast of Greenland and down to Antarctica. And this was a very difficult thing to do, to go into those waters, especially with sailing ships at the time. But as they got up to Greenland or down to Antarctica, they started to see huge fields of ice that they had never imagined before. So here in the scale of this woodcut, here's a sailing ship, and here's the ice face of a glacier from Greenland coming into the sea. This is way, way bigger than anything you would have seen in the Alps or any other out mountain range at the time. So increasingly, he turned, uh, people decided this was plausible. This was something that could have happened. And within a relatively short period of time, people began to look and, and reinterpret these signs that he was pointing out and saying, yes, indeed, there had been periods of ice. And by the end of the 19th century, there were even maps. This one is attributed to a guy named Chamberlain. This is North America. And this is his reconstruction of where the ice sheets in North America were uh, during this former ice age. Of course, they didn't know when that was, but it was a long time ago. And he basically saw there were two big ice sheets on the North American continent. One of them is called the Laurentide ice sheet, this large one. And this is called the Cordelian ice sheet. And they actually had even a little gap between them, which seems more or less accurate. And, and Alaska itself was rather ice-free, oddly. And so this was the first reconstruction of the ice age in North America, and it turns out it's not a bad one. If you look modern reconstructions, I'll show you this one. Uh, it's not that different. Here is um, 
Here would be North America. Here's Greenland. He didn't have Greenland in there, but this would be North America. You see the, the uh, ice would have gone quite far down. It would have been actually to about the, the northern border, the southern border of New York, beginning of Pennsylvania. And this would be it today. This is pretty much ice free, except for Greenland still. And of course, in the Southern hemisphere, which you can't see is, uh, is Antarctica. And during the winter, the, uh, the, the North Pole, of course, is covered with sea ice. So it, it was really pretty good. By the end of that 19th century, there was actually not a bad view of what the ice age had been. Again, they still didn't know when it was. Um, they knew there had been multiple ice ages, though, by the way, because you could see signs of ice at different levels separated by um, plant remains. So you knew there had been ice and then a warm period where plants were growing and then more ice. So they knew there had been multiple ice ages within this, this last ice age, but they couldn't tell exactly when. So their relative view of the timing, this is you know, a terribly frustrating thing. When did this all occur? How long ago? And they really didn't know except in a relative sense. And they depended on fossils as I pointed out. And they even started digging cores out of the ocean and out of the ice, like in Greenland and eventually in, in Antarctica. And especially in the sea cores, they found remains of, of a plankton. And these plankton are which are microscopic, but they actually have remarkable structures to them. These are woodcuts due to um, the uh, artist and uh, biologist of the 19th century, Ernst Haeckel, who uh, actually was very interesting, uh, influential in the Art Nouveau movement. But these are kind of strange looking creatures, actually. It's hard to say whether these are more art or biology, but this is what their skeletons look like. And it turns out the warm seas had different kind of uh, plankton than the cold seas did. So if you, if you dug a core, not too terribly deep, actually a meter or two deep, and you could find that the plankton had changed, you could infer that at one time this was a warm sea, and then it was a cold sea, and then it was a warm sea again. So you could get that roughly uh, relativistic view of the dating. Now today, actually since World War II, there was a huge leap forward because there became methods for actually assigning real dates. And the first method is called radiocarbon dating, which was uh, discovered or invented by a guy named Walter uh, Libby at the University of Chicago shortly after World War II. And that has now been elaborated to a number of mechanisms. There are actually many physical and chemical ways of getting dates. And nowadays, the people who do this dig deep cores or even put together cores from different places in the ice, either in Antarctica or in Greenland. And they can reach back quite a long way. These are graphs that go back about 400,000 years. And this first graph shows temperature variation over that period. And the first thing that strikes your eye is that there is cyclical variation. There's a regular change beside the erratic nature of this thing. The second curve is carbon dioxide. Now you might say, how do you get that? Well, it turns out if you dig down into the ice, there are little bubbles of air in these ice cores. And if you carefully extract the bubbles of air at different levels, you can see the air that is encased in them and you can analyze the air and you can see that there is carbon dioxide, which we obviously know today is a greenhouse gas. And it too shows these similar cycles. And then there are other things you can infer from that. This happens to be dusk, which I won't go into, but we're now in a very exciting era where you can actually get these things quantitatively and we can date roughly when these occur. And that's when the current date, the dates I gave you at the beginning, 2.6 million to 12,000 years, that's actually fairly recent 
updating of about 15 years ago. Now here's a curve, speaking of carbon dioxide, that ought to be very familiar to everyone. These are measurements taken of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere starting in about 1960. And it coincides a little before the rise of concern with global warming. And the idea is that there are some of these gases like carbon dioxide, which have the effect of warming the atmosphere. And are these increasing in the atmosphere? And indeed they are. You see this very regular sawtooth pattern from year to year. And here's one year magnified. And the, can anybody guess what the sawtooth version comes from? What the up and down version comes from each year? Summer and winter. Yeah, exactly. Uh, although you need to elaborate, but you're basically right. Most of the vegetation on land is in the Northern hemisphere. And in the springtime, when uh, leaves are coming out in vegetation, it absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So the atmosphere carbon dioxide goes down. And in the fall, when the leaves turn brown, the carbon dioxide goes back in the atmosphere. So it keeps cycling year by year as you go through this kind of thing. But the general trend of this, as is well known, everybody knows this by now, is going upward. And of course, by now it's also well known that much of this is due to human production, uh, burning of fossil fuels of one kind or another. That's point number one. And point number two uh, is these are accumulated temperature curves of global temperature. And the reason, the trustworthy dates come from about 1850. And again, you can see with a lot of erratic behavior, there's a general upward trend, especially in the last 50, 60 years or so. This is a little bit of a diversion from the essence of my Ice Age talk, but uh, it's something that I couldn't resist throwing in here. But anyway, uh, so I want to get, I'm not going to go in detail of the causes of ice ages, which are still not fully understood, but there are basically three causes of the various ice ages, two of which are relevant for the Pleistocene ice age. One of them has to do with Earth's orbit around the sun. And it's not a perf perfect ellipse. The parameters of the ellipse change. And as a result of the changing parameters of the ellipse, we get more or less sunshine in the, uh, in the summer, northern hemisphere summertime. And uh, that accounts for the accumulation or lack of accumulation of ice. Um, that's one thing, the orbital changes in the Earth's orbit. The second thing is the rise and fall of carbon dioxide. And through most of the ages, that has been natural. It hasn't been human, obviously, at all until the Industrial Revolution period, Revolution period when we started using so much coal and other fossil fuels. But there have been natural uh, increases and decreases of uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, and they seem to be related to the rising and falling temperatures of the climate. And the third thing, which takes place much too slowly to have a affected the Pleistocene Ice Age, but for those five ice ages that seem to have occurred over the very, very long run, the various changes in the placement of continents and the flow of currents through the ocean and of air through the ocean, more or less spreading equatorial heat to the poles or away from the poles, those seem to also be factors that come into play. Or not, though not as well understood. So I'm not going to go into any detail of those, but I'm going to shift gears on you. All right. <clears throat> so any questions at this point or comments? We okay together? Okay. So remember, the first story of this book is how did we come to understand there was an ice age? The second story of this book is what is its effect on human society? And um, we know about evolution these days, of course, and we know the appearance of hominid 
type animals. That means after separating from the line that would become modern apes to the, from the line that would become modern humans. That seems to have occurred from DNA evidence of about six or seven million years ago, that division seems to have occurred. Again, it's not that we descended from them or they descended from us. The line split, the lineage is split and each proceeded in their own direction. And the, the line that would eventually become us actually produced a lot of forms of hominid animals, a lot of uh, creatures that were more or less like we are, uh, more human looking than ape looking. And the two big transformations in that evolution that separate us from let's say chimpanzees or gorillas today is when did that line start to become upright and walking on fours on knuckles or uh, start walking on twos? That happened about six or seven million years ago. And there's a group of fossils of various kinds called orthopithecines, And they seem to have been upright walkers. You may have heard of Lucy, is probably the most famous orthopithecine um, uh, remain. Uh, but she had a very small brain. And um, the real transition that we start to call homo is not only that the, these creatures walked upright, but that they had large brains. And when you get that, when you get that kind of creature, there's that anthropologists call them homo, the genus homo. Now, there are many species of homo. Um, and we probably don't begin to know all of the species of Homo that have existed. But uh, here are a few, see on my screen, I can't even uh, I get rid of those. On my screen, this is a chimpanzee skull. These are not real skulls, these are facsimile skulls. This is an orthopisthene skull. This is, uh, this is a skull that is viewed as being on the humanish side rather than the apish side of these descendants. And this is a, a skull that is considered to be a homo already. It's a, a very successful species that lived for about one to two million years ago. And this is a kind of a, a hominin called Homo erectus, uh, upright with a big brain actually, fairly big brain. And this is a facsimile of a homo sapiens skull like us. Again, it's not too terribly different. It doesn't have the protruding eyebrows and, and it's got a chin much more and it's got a more upright face, but this is up. And we haven't existed that long. This kind of human has been around for maybe 200,000 years. So these guys far preceded us and were far more successful in terms of time spent on Earth. But these are the, this is the line of, of Homo that we're most interested in. And of course, the most famous of these people is Neanderthal, Homo Neanderthal, which were really not that different from us. This is, a, this is an early picture from about the 1920s from the um, American Museum of Natural History in New York. And you can see it's got a kind of a brutish look to it. They were, they were kind of uh, viewed as a Hobbesian kind of animal, kind of slow, brutish, and, and, and dumb. Uh, here, for fun, is a more modern rendering of what a homo Neanderthal would look like dressed in a, a current suit. I, I'm not convinced that he would be unrecognizable for uh, someone kind of different from us if you met him on a subway, but uh, and that being the case, you can see how flexible these interpretations are. Anyway, us humans, Homo sapiens, so far as we know, were the lone species on Earth of Homo by about 40,000 years ago. And for most of that period of time, we were hunters and gatherers, presumably living in very small groups, um, not dumb. We really don't know anything about the linguistic abilities 
of these people, but the more that we learn about them or find their remains, the more impressed we are with them. Uh, in about the last century or so, we've become particularly intrigued by uh, numerous cave paintings that have been left by Homo uh, Stone Age, you could call them Stone Age Homo sapiens. And uh, this is an interesting one. This is probably about 13,000 years ago. And you can see the animals that this artist left behind. Here's a mammoth. Now, mammoths don't exist anymore, but you can see that uh, this was a kind of a common theme in these paintings. And some of these paintings are incredibly artistic. Um, if you think of them as being highly primitive, it's very hard to reconcile some of their creations with that. This is a painting of a horse. And before I had any interest in this topic, when I was still at a university, uh, I saw a poster of this particular cave painting and I just liked it. I thought it was so aesthetically pleasing that I stuck it on my apartment wall, which is the reason for old time's sake, I pulled it up for this showing. There's, there's really quite an aesthetic skill to these, to these people who were essentially cave people. Here is a, a less well-known, I suppose, but this is a very stylized kind of hand-sized figurine. Um, I happen to have a replica on my desk, which I can't show you, but, but this is, a, I don't think you can call it a sex symbol. I don't know what the mind of, of people who lived back then were like, but it's hard to think that this would have been regarded as a sexy image, but it's a very obviously a female image. Uh, it might have to do with fertility. It shows swollen breasts, navel, vulva, uh, the heads are not there. There's a stylized head there instead of a face. This was a very common, uh, maybe a cult image, but there are many of these figurines found around Europe over a few thousand year period. But you can see there's a lot of skill there. And you can also see there is a lot of cultural continuity over a large area that they would make the same kind of figure over and over in different places in there. So, you know, you, you assign any meaning you like to them. We just have no way of knowing. Now, I'm going to go back to just a plain old non-aesthetic temperature curve to you and show you the significance of this thing. This is, this, it's remarkable when you think that we can do this kind of thing. We can actually calculate what global temperatures were like at these periods of time. This goes back 20,000 years. And uh, this is a temperature curve. So the lower temperature is lower on the graph, higher temperature goes up. Here's part of the Pleistocene. The Pleistocene had been going on for longer than this, and it had its periods of ups and downs in temperature. And here we're coming toward the end of the Pleistocene. This is about 12,000 years ago, which by international convention is the official end and um, it's getting warm at this point, but then we go through a thousand year period of uh, cooling. This is called the Younger Dryas, and then it gets warm again. And this is the period that we've been living in. For the last uh, 11,000 years, this is the climate. It's been rather warm and rather moderate, and, and almost certainly this has a big implication for humankind, because for 200,000 years, Homo sapiens, not to mention the earlier Homo species, have been living in some sort of hunting and gathering existence. And here things begin to change. Here's where we get the real action occurring. Now, when I was in college, which is quite a long time ago, I was taught that at about, um, about 12,000 years ago, agriculture and settled communities started in the fertile crescent of the old world. And from there, they spread outward. And that was the beginning of agriculture and settlement. And it was a very nice story, but it turns out to not be true, at least as far as it goes. Uh, we also were taught that which came first, settlement or agriculture, and it was a chicken and egg problem. You can't tell which came first. It turns out you can tell, 
And that is settlements came first before agriculture because the earliest settlements in the Fertile Crescent had left behind uh, foodstuffs that were not grown. They were hunted or gathered. They were uh, off the landscape. Gazelles, for example, were hunted. I'm gonna give you, uh, here's one of the earliest uh, settlements that uh, we know of, it's well known. It's the town of Jericho or the ruins of Jericho mentioned in the Bible. There still exists a town in the Palestinian uh, area of the West Bank uh, called Jericho. And this archeological site is almost walking distance from it. And it goes back uh, 12 or 13,000 years. It was originally a non-agricultural settlement where the people, hunted gazelles nearby. They used wild grains that they got. Over the years, it developed. There were numerous layers of settlement. This is perhaps the first known monumental building. This is a tower that is discovered there. This is, oh, probably about 20 meters across. You can see a metal grate is stuck on the top there, not original. Um, there were not walls that tumbled down at the time of the Israelite invasion. There's no, been no discovery of that sort of thing, but it clearly was a long-term settlement. And it goes from a period before agriculture to a period of agriculture. And the very interesting thing is there are a lot of sites like this around the Fertile Crescent, but furthermore, there are a lot of sites like this that aren't anywhere near the Fertile Crescent. If you go to China, there are also the beginnings of agriculture and of settlement. And if you go to India, there are also the beginnings of uh, settlement and agriculture. If you go to the New World in uh, Mesoamerica and in the uh, area of Peru, that's today Peru, there are also areas of agriculture and settlement, and they seem to be independent of one. So something strange happened during this moderate period after the glaciers were essentially melting. Um, and a few thousand years, something even stranger happens. In some of these areas where there was agriculture and settlement, there was a, a development that archeologists have called civilization. Now, just exactly what civilization is, is a little ambiguous. It, it involves a number of things which aren't always present er, invariably. But one of the things they involve is uh, what you call cities. Uh, there would be large collections of buildings. There would usually be different neighborhoods in these buildings. There would usually be some sort of ceremonial centers. There would be more and less impressive buildings, presumably associated with affluence. There would be pottery, usually. There would be normally uh, animals raised, uh, sometimes but not invariably uh, beasts of burden. There would be calendars, there would be metallurgy, there would be pottery, there would be uh, uh, elementary forms of mathematics. You got these things as a package, more or less. Not every, every element invariably true, but more or less true. You got astronomy. You could predict eclipses and, and you knew the length of the year. Um, and this happens not once, but in several places within a few thousand years. And that would be in the Middle East, like particularly in the area of Mesopotamia, the cities of Sumer, we call them. Uh, they happen uh, somewhat later in Egypt. They happen in India, they happen in China, they happen a little bit later in Mexico, and they happen uh, in Peru. And almost certainly these are independent of one another. It's very, very strange to think of this all happening. There was a guy, I don't know if any of you ever heard of it, but there was a popular writer some years ago named uh, Van Donegan. And he wrote a series of books and he argued he, he, that these things were so similar and they occurred at such similar times that they must have been planted on Earth by ancient astronauts who came from another world. 
And uh, please don't walk away from here saying that I'm advocating ancient astronauts coming in, but I, I just mentioned him to emphasize how weird this is and how unexpected this is from as recently as, you know, 30 years ago. I'm not sure what's being taught in high school classes these days about the ancient world, but, but uh, all of a sudden these things occurred. And the, evolu the explanation I think that is, um, is developing is that, well, kind of with the climate changing after the recession of the ice ages, with the climate changing, uh, it's just like one thing goes to another. When you have humans that have these abilities put in certain environments, they're just gonna develop certain ways and among the ways they're going to develop is aggregating into these large cities, not inevitably, perhaps, but often. Um, we developed an understanding of some of these early uh, settlements. Excuse me, this is a period of nuisance phone calls coming in. Uh, we developed uh, some understanding of these civilizations oh, over the last 150 years as archeologists were developed, and, I, and I'm just gonna kind of end up with a, the, the wonderful story of Troy. I'm sure you've all read some of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey about the Trojan War. And uh, of course, we don't really know whether there was a Trojan War. We don't even know if there was a Troy, and we don't even know if there was actually a person named Homer, but, but those stories come down to us and, um, in the uh, later part of the 19th century, a guy named Heinrich Schliemann, who had made a lot of money, was a German American. He made a lot of money and he decided he was gonna search for the city of Troy. So he partnered up with a couple of people and he went to Turkey, the coast of Turkey, roughly, he didn't know exactly where Troy was supposed to be, but there was a big mound there that some people thought was Troy. And he started digging through it. And he had workmen digging very, very hastily to get through it to find whatever they could find, kind of like an Indiana Jones enterprise. And, and he, he found a lot of stuff, actually. He got down to the lowest level of his tell and he found uh, jewelry and he found uh, masks and things. And in the meantime, he was shedding his old wife and he got himself a young new wife. This, her name is Sophia, and he decked her out in some of the um, some of the loot that he found, and he he called this uh, Priam's treasure. And uh, there's no reason to think that it actually belonged to Priam, but this is the story that he he created out of this stuff. And modern dating figures that if there was Troy there, he actually dug through it. He was going to some earlier earlier level than Troy. So they almost certainly didn't find Troy. But what he was finding was very impressive societies, what we now call civilizations. And so these civilizations by modern dating have been around since about four to 5,000 years ago. And again, as I said, we find them in different areas of the countries of the world. It's not like they started in one place and then diffused to other places. They somehow, like Van Dagen points out, they somehow originated in different spots. It's really quite a remarkable thing. This is, of course, the Egyptian kingdom is another example. Everybody knows probably uh, this mask. This is King Tut's funeral mask, who was found by probably the second most famous person in e Egyptology named uh, Carter. He dug this thing up from one of the rare unspoiled graves, unrobbed graves. And this has become uh, uh, quite an icon of these ancient civilizations. So they were, they were very common. And uh, it's also interesting to point out some of the similarities. Now, this is one of the earliest pyramids of Egypt. It's called the Step Pyramid. And this is one of the pyramids of Mexico. Now, there's no way imaginable that these societies could have been in touch with each other, unless ancient astronauts, of course. But yet, for some reason or other, the human aggregates in these opposite sides of the world were building similar 
structures in a way. I don't know. Is that is that something deep in the human psyche? Is that uh, is that just gravity acting on building material, or, or what's going on there? It's it's quite an interesting thing. Anyway, I I think that's enough of my accumulated notes. So let me throw it open if you have any questions. <laughs>